get started for today. So I'll just reiterate some questions that were coming up about homework three. I also just posted uh, to the YouTube thing uh, a recording of the office hours where we talked about homework three, well, we talked about Hindley Milner type inference at a high level. So we didn't talk about uh, specifics of any problem, but we talked also about type equivalents and how you can tell uh, something of the same type. Uh, guys. All right, so, uh, so just to reiterate some questions where people came up to me right beforehand. So if you see something used in when you're doing this uh, type inference, and it's being used as a function in an apply, and it has one parameter, right? you see it later being used as a function with zero parameters in a different apply, does that type check? No, because you can't, that function can't be both a function that takes in one parameter and a function that takes in zero parameters. Those definitely don't type check. Um, and then on your homework, if you're trying to do it and you get to a point where the constraints can't be satisfied, then what do you have? A type error. Yeah, exactly. And you should probably explain why you think there is a type error, uh, just in case you're wrong, and maybe we can give you some partial credit. Any other questions? So those were the questions that just came up. Anything else on homework three? Yeah. Uh, what kind of work do I want you to show? Uh, what would be good is labeling every node and showing, like, as a type, and then showing what the constraints are. As you, I mean, you can do it as you go through it or not, right? I mean, you can kind of do it like we did first and follow set, where you see how that type changes, right? So you have, you know, T1 is equal to TA, right? And so you know that that's a constraint. Uh, so as long as you're keeping track of that in some kind of order we can understand, that'll help a lot. Yes. So if there's some error, is it okay to just interrupt? If what? If there's some error, a type error, is mm -hmm. it okay to just interrupt? Or is how would, it's an error that yeah. can't be interpreted, right? So how well, it's, an, it's an error because the, the types match, don't match, right? So the base case, I mean, one case is you have one type of an integer. You have an A, the type of A is an integer over here. And somewhere else in the tree, A is the type of a Boolean. So that's clearly different. If I try to like add a string to an integer, oh. that would be like... Say type error, and you yes. say exactly that. So this yes. has the type of integer, and this has a type of string. And the output? You just say type error. Yeah. I mean, you can say type error and then explain you it. You said that also three, or like, I'm talking about the... Oh, oh, oh. Uh, oh, in the project? Yeah. Oh, in the project, it's... No, I mean the whole Oh, in the homework, no, you don't have to keep. You don't have to keep going, right? As soon as you, there's a type error, it doesn't matter what else happens. There's a type error. Um, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Types, types, types. Okay. And now we go back to the land without types. Okay, so this is where we left off on Monday. So we're talking now about the runtime environment and how does the code that we write actually get translated to assembly and specifically how do local and global variables work? Yeah. I just want to ask a question on the project. Uh, sure, depends on what it is. Uh, yeah. Well, I just, like, I have no idea where you would start on, like, type checking. Where to start on type checking? Uh, you need to start keeping track of the types, just like uh, like you do when you're manually doing any of their type inference, right? So uh, you need to keep track of what things have what types. And where you do that is up to you, right? Kind of the, the quick implementation-wise is you just modify all the parsing statements to keep track and update some global data structure. Um, if you want to do it super clean but may take longer, you kind of create those same uh, statements like all the print statements, uh, like the prints, those all go through the entire tree. You can make a new thing of those that deal with type checking, and then you can do it that way. But I mean, the easiest implementation wise is to put it in the parsing statements, in the parsing code. So yeah, first step, get your parsing code working. Then you verify that that's working. Then you need to think about what data structures do I need to know about the types? And then how do I fill in those data structures as the program is being parsed? All right, anything else? Cool. Okay, so we're talking uh, about the runtime here. So this is the environment where our code lives. And specifically, we've been looking at how do 
So we, we said that we can use kind of static memory for storing global variables, and we can use the stack to store local variables that are local to our function. And we looked at the uh, function frame, so we looked at um, how we're going to use this uh, frame pointer or base pointer that's different for each function invocation. So that way local variables are offsets of this rather than some static fixed location. This is where we were, right? Okay, perfect. At least vaguely familiar. Okay, so we have this program. Uh, it has three local variables, A, B, and C. Uh, we set A, B, and C to things. We add A to B stored in A, and then we just return. Uh, so we looked at what this looks like in kind of pseudocode, right? So the compiler just gives each local variable A, B, and C some offset from the base pointer. And so it's going to say, you're at offset A, you're at offset B, you're at offset C. And then in pseudocode, it's going to look like, OK, the memory address at EBP plus A is equal to 10. Uh, the memory address at EBP plus B is 100, 10.45, and add them together. And so we looked, and by looking at the code that the compiler generates on uh, for x86 on set OS 6.7, the same thing, thing we've been using, it decides that A is located at offset negative C, uh, B is located at offset negative 8, and C is located at offset negative 4. Uh, that's just how it decided to do it. And so we looked at the code. So it's first moving the stack pointer into EBP. So what is this doing? Yeah, so it's, exactly, so it's establishing, so the stack pointer when it gets to main is going to be pointed somewhere in the stack. We don't know where, but we want that EBP register, which is what we're going to calculate all the offsets here, we want that to point to wherever the stack currently is. Uh, then we need to make room for these local variables on the stack, because otherwise we may end up rewriting them. Uh, so here we're subtracting uh, 16 in, the, in base 10 from the stack and moving the stack pointer down. <laughs> then we're going to move uh, hex A, or the value 10, into EDP minus C. And so we know EDP minus C is the variable C. Um, then we're going to move uh, 100, which is hex 64, into EDP minus 8, uh, which is this here. And then we're going to move that crazy uh, floating point representation of 10.45 into EAX. Uh, then we move EAX into uh, EBP minus 4, which is where C is located. And then finally, we are going to do the add instruction. So we're going to move uh, what's in, uh, we're going to move B into EAX, and then we're going to add what's in EAX, which is the value B, and store it at, uh, at sorry, we're going to add what's in EAX with EBP minus C, which is A, and we're going to store that in A. So what's going to be an A should be A plus B, so it should be 110, yeah. So yeah, you have, you have the, st the stack pointer, and yes. you're moving it down. The stack pointer and the base pointer are at the same point. Right, right? at the top the, here. And then you're moving the stack pointer down. Correct. And then you're setting the variables according to this base pointer exactly. at each spot, right? Yep. And then, and, but you're not actually moving the base pointer, you're just, you're just, you're just placing the values of A, B, and C according yes. relative to that position. So we're going to see an example. So yeah, so the basic idea here is that throughout this program's life. So obviously if our program was longer and more complicated, there's going to be more code in here. But the base pointer for our function main here is never going to change. So that way, anywhere in this function, the compiler knows, hey, to where's the, what's the address, where's the location of C? Oh, it's at EBP minus four. It doesn't matter where it is in that function, because as the function executes, we may push or pop things off the stack depending on what we need to do. So the stack pointer can change, but because we stored this base pointer, uh, we know that that's a fixed offset for the lifetime of the function. Does that mean? Yeah, but why do we move the load to the EAX and then move the EAX and the offset? I don't know 100%. I think it is some compiler optimization. Um, yeah, or some GCC thing says that it's more efficient to do this when you have to specify the whole value here, all 32 bits, uh, because that's going to be in the instruction. So. Cool. Okay. So let's look at, so this is kind of just looking, we stepped through the code, so now let's actually look at how, and look at a visualization of how this, what the stack is and how it changes throughout this code being executed. Uh, so we have the exact same code that we just saw here on the right. Uh, we have the top of the, the stack, which is going to be all Fs, 
Uh, the bottom, at the very bottom of the stack, what's going to be at the very bottom of the stack? Zeros, yeah. Um, so we have our stack, right? So um, once we're going to start again at uh, 10,000 in hex, which, so our stack pointer is going to be pointing here when this first instruction is executed, right? So what's in the dots, the triple dots above us on the stack? Um, memory we don't want to mess with. Memory we don't want to mess with, right? Because somebody may be called main, um, and we don't know, we know the stack pointer is here, and we know that what's above us is stuff that we shouldn't touch because somebody's using that. What about the stuff below us? Garbage, yeah. Yeah, it's garbage, right? We don't care about that stuff. Awesome. Okay, so we have the three registers that are important here, uh, EAX, ESP, which is the stack pointer, and EDP. Uh, so right now, which of these three registers do we know for certain the value of? ESP. What do you want to raise your hand? Yeah. ESP. Why ESP? So then what's going to be the value of ESP? We don't know. You just said you knew. You know the location. Uh, so what's going to be in the register ESP? 10,000, right? So it's kind of a circular argument. But basically, I said, OK, the stack pointer is pointing here, right? But there's no arrow in the machine that literally points here, right? The only reason why we know the stack pointer is actually here is because there is the value 10,000 in ESP. But do we know it's in EAX or EBP? No, it could be anything, right? Um, we'll kind of see how that, how that plays in later. But yeah, for right now we don't care. So we start our execution. We're going to start right here at this very first instruction, right? Uh, so this is going to move ESP into the base pointer, right? So, um, so then after this instruction executes, what's going to be the value of EDP? 10,000, 10, right? Yeah, so this instruction just said move ESP, whatever the value is there, into whatever's in, and into EDP. Wait, I don't know what do you mean by move? Isn't it already there at 10,000? When, like, if you were to call this function, you would start to set up the stack pointer and, and the base pointer. Is it the stack pointer already exists at the bottom? The stack. stack pointer already exists, yeah. So right now the stack pointer is pointing to the bottom of the stack. Okay. But the base pointer, right? The base pointer could be anything. We don't know what we get here. Exactly. That's whoever called us base pointer, essentially. So we want to do here, right? Because all of our offsets are based on the base pointer and the frame pointer. Um, so we need to move and say, OK, wherever the stack is now, right? Because we know everything after that is free memory. So let's say, let's. We're going to say EDP is at 10,000 hex right now. Um, and so that's the, all the semantics here. Just move the value that's in this register and put it in this register. Pretty simple. So now we're going to subtract uh, hex 10 from ESP. Uh, so what's 10,000 10, hex minus 10? Like smaller hex number. Smaller number? <laughs> 9,000. Good. That's 16, 16 smaller? Six. Uh, FFF zero should be. Is that right? I feel like it's maybe wrong now, but. Yeah. Well, wrong. How, how is that zero? Should be, if you're subtracting 10 from 16, it's six. Uh, yeah. Wait. Wait. Hex, but it's hex. It's hex, six, hex, actually 16. No, that makes sense. Um, okay. sure it should be C. Yeah. No, C's not enough. Because C would be only subtracting. Two, right? No, three, four. This is when we pull up our handy dandy calculators, which I thought is what I did. All right, so 10,000 minus 10. Yeah, FFF zero. So plus 10. Boom. Math. <laughs> no, actually, it's more like calculators. They're handy. Good. All right, room full of computer scientists, right? Uh, I didn't get it either. OK, so yeah. I, who does hex math in their head? It's crazy, right? I don't know how to do that. Um, so anyways, so we calculated the value. The value is FFF0. And so how many, so we're currently pointing here. If each of these lines is four bytes, right? So we're going, we, we decreased ESP. So which direction is the, 
the uh, arrow going to go, up or down? Down. Down, right? So it's going towards smaller addresses. So how many are we going to move it? Four, four. One, two, three, four. So hopefully, if everything goes correctly, it should end up here. Does everybody agree? Yeah. Any disagree? So this would be, yeah, OK. Yay, OK. Good, OK. But so this is where the stack pointer is. Uh, but where's the base pointer? Still at 10,000. Right, still at 10,000. So now we're going to have two arrows, right? So I hope this isn't super confusing, but you can always look at the, uh, the registers here to see where that value is, right? So the stack pointer is now pointing further down the stack. So based on the semantics that we talked about, right? So everything uh, below FFF0, what is it? Garbage, yeah, replaceable. But stuff above, important, right? Yeah, good stuff. And you could think of this, we kind of talked about this on Monday, you could think of this as like an allocation, right? We've essentially said, hey, I'm going to use these four values, and so um, this is how I want to keep that information there. Yeah? Um, why is it you move the stack down four spaces when there's three variables? <coughs> I prefer you always add an extra Um. I think we'll see why later. I'm not 100% sure in this example why. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to store the previous uh, Yeah, uh, but that's, anyway, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, okay, so we subtracted 10 and hex from ESP, and the answer surprised us all. Uh, then we're moving the value, remember, the dollar sign here is the constant value 10 or A, well, it is 10, 10 in decimal A in hex into EVP minus C. Uh, so where's EVP, so where's EVP? 10,000. 10,000? Anybody want to try 10,000 minus C? Maybe do process of elimination to figure out where it is, right? I think it's S. FFF, what was that? Yeah. FFF4? So which would that place it? One, tell me when to stop. One, two, three. Should have one arrow. I guess I I'm on three, I was like here. Um, here or here? 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 Yeah. But this is FFF0. This is a stack pointer. So one more? Okay, yeah. So that's the other way to kind of do it. In your, I mean, kind of in your head, as you say, okay, well, I know this is one, two, uh, I know this was uh, minus 16, and this is minus uh, 12, uh, which is C, so I know it should be four above the next one above that one. So, um, so we're going to move, so what, oh, and now I'm going to make it a lot easier by putting the actual values here so we can see what these all are. Somebody can verify that these are actually the correct addresses here. Looks good, good, I like that. Okay, so then we're gonna move um, the constant value, we're gonna move the constant value A, hex A, into FFF4, which is EVP minus C, right? So which, which variable is EVP minus C? What was that? A. A? Yeah, so also remember we set A is equal to 10. Right, so that's another way to think about it. Okay, great. So we've executed this instruction. Now we have the next instruction. Move uh, hex 64, which I believe is decimal 100. We're going to move that into EVP minus 8. Uh, what's EVP minus 8? FFF8. FFF8. That's a lot easier when the things are here, right? You just count. Okay, so then we're going to move the constant value 64 into that memory location. And then we're going to move on to the next instruction. And then, so, um, so have we changed the stack pointer or the base pointer? No. no, should we have changed the base pointer? No. No, we should never change the base pointer during our function's execution. Cool, okay, so now we're gonna move this triply, uh, this floating point value into EAX. So EAX is, now we actually know the value that's in that register. Uh, so we essentially just erase whatever was in it, we don't care about it. And then we're going to execute this next instruction to move whatever's in that register into EVP minus four. Where's EVP minus four? FFFC, which is which 
um, which uh, variable name in our original program? C. 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 And what type was C? Float. 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 Yeah, which makes sense, right? So we have here you have uh, an integer 10, the integer 100, and a floating value uh, at A, B, and C, local variables to our function main. So wait, that, that long hex number represents the original value of C? Yes, that rep is the floating point representation of 10.45. Yeah? Is there a difference between move and move L? Is there, uh, is there a difference between move and move L? Yes, move L is move along value. Um, I don't know why the compiler decided to do this one versus the other one. Okay, so then uh, we, oh yeah, we want to move that value onto the stack, which is what we just did. So now C, so that took care of, these two instructions took care of the uh, C code of C is equal to 10.45. All right, now, uh, now we're going to move EBP minus 8. Uh, so what, what's the value in EBP minus 8? OX64. Yeah, 64, which is 100. So essentially B. So we're taking B, we're going to move it into EAX. Oh, so yeah, so I uh, kind of have here A, B, and C, right, to kind of relate it to the variables. Remember, right now the program doesn't, this binary, this assembly code doesn't care at all about variable names or types or anything. All it is is moving bits around using these assembly instructions. So we're going to move that into EAX. What happened here? Oh, that kind of went away. Um, then we are going to go on to the next instruction. And this final instruction is where we're going to do, uh, I believe the original uh, line was A is equal to A plus B. Right? So here we're going to take EAX, add it to whatever is in EBP minus C, and store the result in whatever's in EBP minus C. So this is a kind of shorthand notation. Whatever the destination is, is on like an add, is where you're going to put the result. Um, so what's EBP minus C, which variable? A. A, which, does that make sense semantically with what our program wanted to do? Yes. Yeah, our program was A is equal to A plus B. Right? And so we got the value of B in EAX. And then we're going to take that value, add it to A, which is what we know we wanted in our expression. And then we're going to save that value back into A. So A is now forever changed. So we're going to execute this. It'll be 6E, I believe. Sure. Feels like it's wrong, but I think it's right. Hex math doesn't make any sense. Okay. Is it right? Okay, so then we get here, and then we're all done. So questions on this kind of example? Yeah. Would anything change, like, if you said uh, A plus equals B, as opposed to A equals A plus B? Nope. So A plus equals B is basically syntactic sugar for A is equal to A plus B. Okay. So the same instructions are going to be generated. So in this case, uh, syntactic sugar just means that uh, whatever that syntax is can be expressed in other ways in the language. So there are basically synonyms that yeah. in programming that are going to cause the compiler to... Yeah, in different, different languages do that. So actually C, Sharp, and Java do that a lot. So when they introduce a new, like, uh, I don't know, like uh, any of you C Sharp with like link or plink queries? Nobody? Um, uh, not necessarily lambda functions, but you can essentially write a SQL query, like select blank from blank in blank, and it looks like crazy code. And it is code, but the compiler actually translates that to a series of function calls. So you could do the exact same thing yourself um, before, it's just it has a nice syntax to do it now. Um, similar things to lambdas and like Java, uh, the new Java and C Sharp. Those also translate in a certain way so that they're backwards compatible. So you kind of could have done it, but they make it a lot easier. Cool. Any other questions on this function frame? Yeah. So, uh, so the basically we are using the base pointer just to allocate some some uh, frame to the function, right? That's what we are doing, and we are allocating it as 16 bytes. But maybe function will need more than that. 
Because in the second step, we are allocating the 16 bytes to right. mm -hmm. this function. Yep. So maybe we will need more than that. So this is C code, right? So where are you supposed to declare variables in C code in a function? At the top. At the top, right? Right at the beginning. I mean, I think in later versions you can define them anywhere, but suffice it to say that by looking at the code, right, you can look and see what are all the local variables in that scope, right? So as a compiler, you know what are all the variables in this function. And you know what are the types of all those variables, so I know exactly the size that I need to store them. Um, so yeah, you can do this all at compile time. And that's, this is actually exactly why when you declare in a local variable, a like an array, a buffer, you have to specify the exact size. Like it has to be a car bracket 50 or 100, so the compiler knows it needs to reserve 100 bytes here on the stack for your buffer. Otherwise, if it was dynamically allocated, right, it would completely mess things up. Yeah. So, yeah, so you said in newer versions of C, say I do all these operations, like I mm -hmm. have a bunch of loops and conditional statements, and it's like two pages for one function. At the very end, I declare a new local variable, like in value, yeah. and I return that value. Um, so that value wasn't declared at the beginning of the function. So how does, how does that, how does that new C standard? You just look at the, uh, you look at the whole, it just makes the parsing slightly more complicated. Right? It's just that um, you basically you can look at the whole function once. Right? You can go through the whole function, look at all the declarations, pull that out, and now you know exactly how many variables and what their types are, and done. So instead of kind of just doing it as you're going, and just like, bam, I know exactly how many variables because they're at the top here, uh, I can go through it all once, and then say, know what to put there. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah, so all the compiler needs to do really is to make sure that they essentially allocated enough room on the stack here for the local variables and that um, these local variables have, um, and that each of the offsets from the base pointer are used the same. So everywhere it uses the value C, it's using EBP minus four. And then everything uh, works awesomely. Um, so this is kind of uh, what, the, what just like the local variables look like. So this is what the frame pointer is used for for local variables. Uh, but now we're kind of going to talk about functions a little bit. So then we can see, well, how do we actually use this to call functions? Like who creates, who creates these frames? How does this actually work? Um, so functions. So we kind of this is a little bit of a review, right? So uh, we've talked about semantics of functions. So when you declare a function, what things are you declaring about that function? What you can think of it as like meta information about that function. Yeah. Type. The return type? Yeah. Type what else? Somebody else? Parameters. Who said that? What about parameters? How many? Their type. How many? Their type? Their order? Yeah, exactly. What else? What was that? The name. Who said it? Name. Yeah, name, right? The name of the function. Good. So the function name. Uh, we have the name and type of the parameter. So here we're going to make an English semantic distinction between the formal parameters we're going to say are the parameters in the function. So uh, the function defines the name of parameters x, a, b, c, whatever, and their types. Um, so when we talk about formal parameters, we're talking about the parameters in the function. To separate it from when we call a function, right, we're passing in parameters. So if we just use the word parameters for both, we'd get confused about which ones we're talking about and where. Right? Does that make sense? So formal parameters are in the declaration. They're, I don't know, maybe you can think about it in tuxedos or something. They're very formal parameters. Uh, and the return type, right? So that's pretty much, and I guess the body, we have the body and the code and everything, but that's kind of implied there. So you need to know, do you need to know all this information to be able to call the function? You're shaking your head very vigorously. Uh, you don't need a return type. Um, I don't know. I think I disagree. Because if you're calling it and setting it to a value, right, you probably want to make sure that those types match. Yeah. You don't need to know the name of the formal parameters. You don't need to know. Yeah, that's a good point. So you don't actually need to know the name of the formal parameters. 
right? Because in especially in languages like C and C++, uh, the order of the parameters is what matters, not their not their formal names. Uh, so yeah, but pretty much you need all this information, right? So you can't. This is why you can't. Uh, why you need a function to be declared before it's uh, used in C and C++. Questions on these? All right, so to call a function, so uh, we kind of refer to it as invocation. So you're invoking a function, which is kind of cool. It kind of sounds like magic, right? You're <laughs> invoking some spell that you've done somewhere else. Um, and this is the syntax, so this should be very basic, right? So we're calling a function, f, and we're passing it x1, x2, all the way up to xk. So what are x1, x2, and xk? Parameters. The, the input parameters. Input parameters. Actual parameters. Actual parameters. Somebody's looking ahead that's cheating. No, you can come up with that by yourself. So can they are they just variables? No, because you could put in just just raw data. Like you could input right. just a string if that was a static string that you always wanted to input. Yeah, so you could exactly. So you could put variables as parameters, you can put um, uh, what's the word you just said? Uh, constants. Yeah, exactly. You put constant values in there. What else? Other function functions. You can put other functions in there, as you're finding out in some languages. What about like an expression, right? What about like five plus ten, right? So yeah. So generally, you can think of that. Each of these are expressions, right? So they can be an integer, or they could be a constant integer. They could be a constant string. It could be a variable. It could be the addition of two variables. It could be uh, a plus b minus c divided by 10 times 132, whatever. Uh, any complicated expression you want. And so, as somebody uh, just ruined the whole surprise for everyone. Uh, so what we're going to call these parameters are the actual parameters, right? So these are the actual parameters that go to the function. Um, and so. So then if we want to call these, so if we want to try to invoke a function, well, kind of the question becomes, well then, who creates the frame for that function? And where do the parameters live? Do we put them, like, do we put the parameters in, like, what, what are the parameters, right? What type, they're, are they a variable? Like the uh, the formal parameters, right? Inside the function. Would you just store their addresses so that the compiler knows where they are rather than recreating them? Maybe. So from what we so first, are they variables? No. No? Yes. Well, maybe. Maybe? <laughs> Based on what? It depends on whatever I define. That's a good answer. That's too bad. Yes. Um, I think there are variables that you have to store in a specific function frame because you don't want the ref to reference stack frames up, up well, you, uh, somewhere else because you don't want to mess with other person's operations because that could screw everything. So first thing, right? Are they variables? So can you use them to add things and subtract things? And can you pass them to other functions? Yes. Uh, can you assign to them? Yeah, if you have a function foo that takes in a parameter x, you can say x is equal to 10 and then use that x later on and it's going to have the value 10. So you can assign to them. Um, so they're variables, right? I would say that they vary based on each program, each function invocation. Um, so are they global variables? Yeah, so that's kind of the other thing. So what's the scope of the variables, of the param the, the formal parameter? Yeah. They're just scope. They're just scoped in that function. So where do we want to store them? Just below the base parameter. Not too technically, but generally. Inside. Hmm? Inside. Inside where? Stack. A what? I can't hear uh, you. don't know. It's a good answer. Yeah. Well, what if one of the, I would assume it within the function frame somewhere. Within the stack frame. But, but where is that? Where's the stack? Where's the function frame stored? Below so base pointer, here's, here's below the. Base pointer above stack pointer. Yeah, too specific, too specific. So would we want to store it like global variables in some global uh, storage area that's always static for each function invocation? 
So the same exact problem with local variables, right? So local variables, if we recursively call ourselves, right, if we just have one global static allocation, well, that's going to get overwritten, exactly. And the same thing with parameters. Uh, so where do we want to store them? On the stack. On the stack, yes, as part of the function pane. Uh, but who's going to put those parameters there on the stack? The compiler. The compiler. Mm. Technically true. Best kind of true. The processor. What is it? The processor? I mean, that's also in the same vein, but yes. It's eventually going to be the processor. Is it the function itself? Or Which function? The, uh, the function that is being the call. So we have the caller, the thing that's invoking the function, or the callee, the function itself. The callee, so should the function allocate those, uh, that space? Somebody said something. So we can just go in one direction and we can talk about whether it's right or not. Well, does the, the callee, does it know what's inside of the function it's called? So the callee, so the callee is the function being called. So that is the, here the function f, right? So f does know how many parameters it has, and it knows the size of it, right? But it just knows the formal parameters, right? So it knows its formal names and types. Yeah? When you want the caller to do it, because every time it's called, you would make area for it. But if every, the other way seems odd, it almost seems like it would just call itself forever. Okay, let's go with the first thing that you said. <laughs> we'll ignore going forever, because I don't want to go forever. Um, so, yeah, so it, the caller, right? So one way to think about it, the caller knows what the actual parameters are, right? The function getting called has no idea that you passed it in an expression or that you passed it in whatever, right? All it cares is it can calculate on values. Uh, but the caller is the one, and the caller knows how many parameters, and it knows the types and sizes of those parameters. Uh, so yeah, the invoking function, or the caller, has to create a, uh, is actually creating the frame on the stack to store enough space uh, to hold the actual parameters and to put those parameters in there. Uh, so, uh, okay, oh, I think these are a little bit out of order, but that's fine. Um, okay, so, uh, so we looked at kind of just the frame itself. Okay, no, this is good. So this is just the frame itself to store the local variables is what we just saw, right? So we have the function with local variables a, b, and c. Uh, so when we're calling another function, what information do we need or want? We're invoking some function. Where it was called. What was that? Where it was called so we can return back to that point. Uh, yeah, we want to know, yeah, uh, that's very, yeah, that's good. So we'll want to know. When we're calling a function, we want to know where to come back to, kind of. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because we want to keep that call chain in stack, intact, right? Yeah, so that's one, definitely. I actually don't know if it's on this list, but good stuff. Yeah? You might want to know where the code for the function actually starts. Yeah, where the code for the function actually starts. So where are we, what, where is this code living that we're going to call? Yeah? We need to know its parameters. Uh, we need to know its parameters, exactly. And we need to, um, Somehow, yeah, we need to like make space for those parameters on the stack, right? Uh, what else? What about its return type? Yeah, the return type and value, right? So how do we get that value back from the function? Um, so we have the return value. Uh, we have the parameters. Um, what else? So what was the first thing that we did when we looked at that main function that that main function did? The name? Uh, not quite. Yeah. Local variables. The number of local variables. In there. Local variables, right? Yeah, we want to store information. So we talked about that. But yeah, that's part of it, right? We have some local variables that we want to store on the stack as well, along with the parameters, right? Um, how many EDP registers are there? 
this one, right? So kind of in the same vein as we want to make sure we come back to where we are, this function is going to have its own EVP pointer. Or it's going to use the EVP register to point to its frame, right? So we should probably save our EVP, our base pointer, so that we can get it back after that function executes, right? Because we can't have more than one at a time. Uh, so yeah, we want to save our frame pointer. Uh, so let me talk about the return address. That's good. Uh, local variables. Um, what other space? I think we can maybe talk about it a little bit. What other space may a, a function need to execute? Variables that are allocated to the heap. No, not quite. Close. So what happens when you have a lot of variables? Or uh, let's say, so we have, we have, what was it? We talked eight, we have eight uh, registers, right, that we can use in the CPU. Uh, stack pointer and base pointer are, are already used. Uh, so what happens if we need to use more than, compute on more than six or seven, on six, seven, or eight values? Yeah. Are you talking about the clock list? Uh, maybe. Why don't you describe it and I'll tell so you. So basically, if you have a value inside of a register, and that register is going to be used in the function, then you need to save that value so that you can put it back in after you go back out of the function so that you don't mess up stuff. Yeah, that's actually a good point that I didn't talk about. Um, so I'll put on here temporary variables. So that's if, if that function needs to use some scratch memory, uh, it will allocate that memory for it. Um, the other thing you may want to do, exactly, so we saw that main just copied a value into EAX, right? It just decided, I'm going to take this value and I'm going to put it in EAX. Did it care if there was a value already in EAX? No, it didn't care, right? And so, um, yeah. The battery died on the mic. Hello. Oh, it did. Um, can you not hear me? People always say that. A little bit not? OK. Let's see if we can do some mic. Oh, yeah, it's flashing uh, back. Class cancel. Class cancel. <laughs> uh, probably not. No, this, all this, because they put two batteries right up here so I can just keep going. Um, oh, now, which way did it go? Don't stick it in You have to, well, I have one more battery in case I do that. How does it not say? It's got to be only one way, right? 50 50 chance. That one also says battery. Did I get it right or no? Ah, it doesn't close if it's on the wrong way. See, that's good design. All right, sighting battery testing. Hello? Better? Awesome. No! It's so fast. Okay. Okay, so back to the clobber list, right? So if I'm calculating some value, and as part of calculating that value, I want to call a function, but I've stored my temporary variables in EAX or EDX, that function has free reign over using those registers. So I would actually want to store those values first onto the stack, call the function, and then when that function returns, pop those values back off into the stack. Or I need to save them somehow. How I exactly do it depends, yeah. How does that area for the stack Uh, the compiler knows, because it's outputting all of these instructions, so it knows when it's going that if it's using or not using EAX, EVX. So it keeps a list of basically using ver uh, registers and not using registers. Yeah, so it's kind of a, it's a whole thing about compiler optimization and stuff that we're not going to talk about. But um, yeah, it's a whole thing. And then the question becomes, uh, can you actually use less registers? Like, uh, because spilling onto the stack is really slow because now you're going from these registers that are right on the chip to going out to memory. So um, can you optimize the code to reduce the number of registers you use? Yeah. Um, what if, okay, so what if, this actually contradicts something I asked earlier, but what sure. if you send in like a, an address of a local variable from another function and you want to operate on that specific value at that, at that address 
So if you send like the ampersand of mm -hmm. the int variable, and you want that to change over time, and that that local variable belongs to another function frame, how do you how do you change that local variable in another function? So you can't um, you can't you basically can't right. So that goes back to the semantics of uh, local variables and how long their allocation is valid for. So they're only valid for their scope, and when local variables are outside of their scope, they're uh, deallocated, and so whatever happens. Uh, if, you get, if you somehow get a pointer to them, right, it's garbage. Like, there's no way to guarantee that that value stays in there. Well, you, but you have to have a way to do it mm -hmm. here, because what if, what if I send in, like, a, the address of an invariable A? So from one function, right, you can if you pass in pointers to a function, yeah. that function can dereference that, assuming that those memories out that memory is allocated. Yeah. That's totally fine. The problem when becomes when you return the address of a variable that's on the stack from your local function, that's when it becomes garbage. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. But you but you I'm saying you you're actually referencing a memory above your function frame when you're doing that. You are, yeah, exactly. That's so totally fine. Totally fine. Totally fine, yeah. Because it's the parameter to your function, right? So that means whoever's calling you is giving you permission to use and edit that memory. Exactly. Cool. All right. So the question is, so what order do we do this? We, so we just talked about a bunch of things we stick on the stack. So what order does this happen in? And who does what? I don't know. Is there a natural order from here? Almost. So yeah, there needs to be, uh, basically you need to make, so the other question is, well, what kind of functions do you want to call, right? So in a program that you have all the source to and you're compiling, kind of doesn't matter, you can uh, set on a convention, right? The compiler can just do something. But the problem is if, if you compile something with Microsoft's Visual Studio, some object file, and I want to use that in my program and call your functions, I should be able to do that. But in order to do that, we want to need to make sure that we're talking the same convention as who does what and what order are all these things put onto the stack and what does that mean. Uh, so that's what's known as a calling convention. So this is actually a really important uh, concept to know that there, okay, it's, it is essentially, you know, human decided is people have to decide on a convention. Uh, but then once it's decided, okay, then now, as long as you know how to speak that calling convention, you can call that code, that function can execute, and it can return. Um, so all basically what we talked about, all that information has to be stored in the stack in a specific order. So the other thing, all that information's got to be stored. So who's storing that information? Some things that naturally fall into one or the other, right? Like the function itself, the callee should uh, allocate space for its local variables, right? Because um, to invoke another function, all you need to know is the name, the uh, number of parameters, and the type of each, and the return type, right? Do you need to know how many local variables it uses? No, because otherwise that's crazy, right? You have to pass all this information, and it really doesn't matter to you from the outside calling this function, right? So this is where you kind of split responsibility and say, okay, the callee function, the function that gets called should allocate that space that it needs. Um, so then, then it becomes a question of, okay, who stores the, the, then we have this base pointer, right? So who stores the, my base pointer, the caller's base pointer? Is there a natural way to, where to put that? But you said the caller does it. What makes sense one way or the other? The caller, why the, who said that? Yeah, why the caller? Because the responsibility should probably rely with it. Yeah, so that's a, that's a pretty good argument, right? It's like, it's my base pointer, so if this other function messes it up, it's gonna affect me, so maybe I don't wanna do that. Um, 
What about, is there an argument for the other way? Maybe the callee should save the base pointer? Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, so similar to that, what if the callee doesn't need to use the base pointer and doesn't touch it? What if it has no local variables? Right? So then maybe it's like a premature optimization if every time you call my function, I, you're saving the base pointer, but I never need that base pointer, so I don't care about it. So the point is these are just things that need to be decided, right? So you have to have a convention so that we know exactly whose responsibility what is. Um, and so, yeah, we need to decide who stores what onto the stack. And we talked about, so it definitely, it can vary based on compiler. Uh, it really varies uh, based on, it's pretty crazy. So it can vary based on the processor, so different, like x86, I think is a different calling convention than 64-bit, uh, which has different calling convention than ARM which probably has a different calling convention than MIPS. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that's probably the case. Um, so the processor definitely impacts that, and the processor really informs the uh, assembly language. The operating system, so there's actually calling uh, system calls, like Linux system calls, actually have a different calling convention. They're called the syscall calling convention, as opposed to calling other C programs. Uh, so that makes things more confusing. Uh, the compiler, compilers can do it differently. And, and the operating systems definitely like, Microsoft has its own um, calling convention. So all Windows programs basically use a different calling convention than Linux programs. Um, and even so type of call, that's what I meant like, so you have a program running on Linux, it, it can make fast system calls to the operating system which have one set of, uh, one set of calling conventions versus uh, the system call versus the standard kind of Linux x86 calling convention. Um, so you just need to specify, and actually it's kind of interesting. I believe in C++ you can specify when you like extern a function, you can say what calling convention it requires. So you can actually use code from maybe like a Windows machine or a function, um, as, assuming the calling convention is correct. Questions on this? Okay. So we're going to look at the x86 Linux calling convention. Specifically, it's called uh, C, C decl, probably the C declaration. Um, so this is the standard. So this is everything that's got to happen in this order on the stack. So the caller first pushes the arguments to the function onto the stack uh, in right to left order. So think about the function call, right? Uh, the rightmost parameter is pushed first, and then the second to rightmost parameter is pushed, and then the third rightmost parameter is pushed, all the way to the leftmost parameter. Um, so then, so which, so rightmost or leftmost, higher or lower on the stack? Rightmost is lower on the stack, no. Well, okay, so if it's not that, it's probably the other way, right? So, um, you gotta think about pushing, right? So. Uh, but we kind of envision the stack like this, uh, from the top of the top. So to push things on the stack, the stack's growing towards the bottom. So yeah. Um, so we're going to take the rightmost parameter, push it on the stack. Take the parameter after that, push it on the stack. The parameter after that. Uh, so why might we want to do it like that? Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying it's well, this is a little off what you just asked a second ago, but this, you're saying it's wrong to push the rightmost value to the lowest position, but it shouldn't matter because the stack pointer's already been moved down all the way there, so you know like you're farthest reaching. So this is, so then the question is, how does the, the callee needs to know how to access those parameters, right? So it knows how to access the local variable. We saw it uh, takes the base pointer and it subtracts. Uh, what we're gonna see is, because this is specified, it has to be in this order, it knows that to access a certain parameter, it takes the base pointer and it goes up the stack to access it. And it knows the exact offset because it knows everybody that calls it is going to do it this exact way. So it's got to be the same so that they both know, basically. Um, so this is what I mean, pushing it onto the stack right to left. So it means you take the rightmost, push it, it's here. Take the next one, push it. Take the next one, push it. Take the next one, push it. So the stack's growing down um, and in the rightmost one. So why might you want to, what? 
Think about some crazy C functions that you've used. Why might you want to do it like this? As opposed to the other way. Anybody use the printf function? Please, everyone, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Give me a little hard time. Okay. Uh, how, many how many parameters does the printf take? As many as you need it to, right? It takes an infinite amount of, well, not infinite, right? It takes a finite, but as many as you want number of parameters, right? So it has its own, we're not going to get into exactly, it, we're not going to get into exactly how it does that, right? But if it, so if you think about the stack, right, of parameters, and I have the leftmost parameter as the first one on the stack, and the next parameter, next, 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 right? So if I have it like this, I'll know when I get to the first, I'll always be able to identify the first parameter, no matter how many parameters you give me, right? So I know that first parameter is going to be a string. And then essentially what printf does is it parses that string and it walks up the stack. And it, how much it goes depends on how many print uh, percent signs symbols you have in your print string. But if you had it the other way, at the rightmost value, how does it get to the string? You have to walk through everything else. You'd have to walk through everything else. And, and there's nothing on here to put the number on there. Like, you would have to get the number, know how many arguments there were, walk up the stack to that many, get the string, and then walk down. So um, it's a little bit more natural to kind of go the other way. And this allows you to write functions that take a variable number of arguments in C, oh, which is kind of cool. But it's not impossible to do it the other way, right? You just have to change things. OK. What else does the caller know that the callee does not know? Return type. Uh, return type, the callee knows that. Or the callee knows that, right? It knows the return type. Somebody mentioned it earlier. We were just talking about it in this context, right? So we have the arguments. What else? What was it? The base pointer. It's not the base pointer. It's close. One more thing. What was it? Somebody? Yeah, the return, the, it, the next instruction to be executed in that function, right? So uh, it's going to then push the address of the next instruction in that function to be called. <coughs> Excuse me. OK, so that's the, callee, the caller's responsibility. So actually, this is all the caller needs to do, which is kind of nice, uh, simplifies things. So then the callee, now it's the callee's responsibility to push the previous frame pointer onto the stack, right? And uh, so that's its job. And then it's going to, as we saw in the other example, it's going to create space on the stack for local variables that it needs. Uh, then there's another key point which we didn't mention, but um, what? So, so OK, so we know from this that the, uh, the callee is saving the previous frame pointer. It should put it back by the time it returns, right? So we need that when we call a function, our frame pointer is the same as when we left, right? What else do we really want to make sure is the same from when we call a function to when that function returns? Yeah? I don't know if it's the, the EDP or the other uh, So the, so the yeah, callee is yeah. going to put the base pointer back, which is the frame pointer. Yeah. Uh, but what about the other one? What's it called? What is the the stack pointer. Yeah, yeah, the stack yeah. pointer, which points to the bottom of the stack, right? Yeah. So yeah, if we call a function and it like moves the stack down, well now it's completely, it didn't free up and properly deallocate all the memory that it thought it, that it used. And so now our stack is all met, messed up and the whole pro, uh, program is going to crash. Um, so it's up to the callee to ensure that the stack is consistent at the same place as when it returned. And then just like I mentioned, so we talked about the return value. Uh, so one way to do it would be to basically have the return value as one of the arguments on the stack, right? Um, so that the caller could allocate a space on the stack at, for the return value. Uh, the callee would know to copy the return value into there. Um, but x86, uh, this calling convention ensures that the return value is always in the EAX register. Uh, so that's just by convention. So the caller knows after it calls a function, it can grab whatever's in EAX, and that's the return value. Yeah. So if there's more than one return value? Yeah, what if, what if there's more than one return value? 
Uh, actually, that's so. Can there be more than one return value? Yeah, Python. We're not talking about Python. We're talking about C. Or because so. So that's the other thing, right? So it's pretty clear. So C as a language was designed to be very close to the assembly code, right? C was actually started as basically portable assembly code uh, with some abstractions, right? But that's why you have to worry about allocating pointer, or, you know, allocating memory, pointer deallocation, all this stuff. Um, so in C, can you return, what was that? A structure. Yeah, so what's a structure? So structure is one variable. In memory, what does it look like? Yeah, it just looks like a contiguous chunk of memory with each variable. Um, so actually, that's a good point. I, I actually don't know 100% what happens there. I think the compiler will know that it's um, that the value can't be stored in EAX, so it would do it some other way. I don't know the other way. I, it'll probably put it on the stack, is my guess. Um, yeah, that's a good point. So like, what if the value is bigger than what fits in EAX, right? So that's kind of the downside of using this register, is it works great in 90% of the cases, but those weird side cases you have to somehow deal with. Cool. Questions on this? All right. So I don't think we'll get through this, but hopefully we do. OK, so now we're going to look at how exactly this works and how the stack works So in this case. So here we have our main function. Uh, we have a variable a. a is going to call some function, call e. And it's going to pass the parameters uh, 10 and 4, uh, 10 and 40. And then we're going to set a to be the return of that function. Um, and then we're going to return A. So let's say we're not using C. Let's say we're doing some kind of type inference. What would you be able to infer about the type of call E? Same as the type of job. What is it? Same as the return type of main. Same as the return type of main, correct, which is? Int. Int, exactly. Uh, what else do you know about call E? What was that? Something like that? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a what? Buffing. No, no, it's a, what is, what is poly? What type is it? High level type. No, no, what is the type? It's a function, yeah, it's a function. And then how, how many parameters does that function have? What are the types of those parameters? Ints, and what does it return? Ints, boom, All right, done. So we don't even need to do the rest of this stuff. Um, yeah, we can tell that just by looking at here, right? So we know that, we also could say A is an integer. And we know that call E, uh, because it's assigning it to an A, that A has to be an integer. But then we also know that it's returning the return of call E. So we know that that um, is, has to be an integer as well. OK, but what does this function look like? Super simple function. It takes A and B and adds them together and then adds one to that and returns it. Right? So super, pretty simple code here, right? Right, C code, this is very simple C code. This is much simpler than any project or anything you've done so far. OK, good. Uh, now we're going to look at what the code looks like. So in main, so remember main is just another function, right? So it has to act at the start as if it was called by something. So main first, uh, what's the first thing that we said the call E does? Pushes. Yeah, saves the, uh, saves the previous frame pointer, right? So it's the colleague's responsibility to save the frame pointer. So the first thing it does, it pushes EVP onto the stack, which is the base pointer. It then, as we saw, this should be very similar, it's moving the stack pointer into the base pointer. So now it's creating, so this is where we saw from before, right? Where we saw that it's setting the stack, uh, setting the base pointer to be where the current stack pointer is. Um, because we know we've saved EVP, so everything's good with EVP. Uh, then we create space for our look. We create space on the stack, ESP minus 18. We're kind of, maybe we can talk about why it's doing that. Um, so it doesn't need uh, whatever 18 is in hex bytes on the stack from the local variables here. That's why it's good. It's what? That's why it, it looked at the function and knows that the function is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I hope so, because if we found a bug in GCC, that would be a very big problem, especially on a super simple example like this. Uh, but just looking at this, right, we know there's how many local variables in main? One. Just one. 
What's the size of an int? How many bytes? Four bytes, right? But here we're, what's anybody know 18 hex? What's 16 plus 8? 24? Awesome. Okay, so but we're moving 24 bytes. So the question is why? Um, well, maybe we'll be able to tell by the next line. Well, okay, maybe not. But yeah. Well, because all the, there's five local variables, and then they account for one extra space. Is there five local variables here? Well, yeah, because there's there's a, there's all the, there's in a, in b, and then in a. You don't know about a and b yet. Right, a and b well, don't exist yet. Right there. Well, the parser these, would know though. These are the formal parameters. It does that? So, so good. So okay. Let's look at the next instruction and then see if we can come back to this question. So here we're moving the constant value 28 into ESP plus 4. So we just moved the stack down 18 hex. And now we're, uh, we moved it down. So we're doing what? We're allocating some space on the stack, right? And when we go up from ESP, is that going into garbage or going into good memory? Going into memory that we've allocated. Yeah, going into good memory that we've allocated. So what's 28 in, in the hex? 40. 40. In, 40. No, 28 in hex is 28 or something else. But yes, so it should be 40, right? And then we're going to move 10 hex A into where the stack pointer currently is. Right? So what did we just do in essence? Declare 4, 10 and 40. Where have we put 10 and 40? <laughs> At the end of the memory we allocated, in what order? Right to, right, to right. right to left, 40, then 10. So then what's the next instruction going to be? So what if we, so the stack pointer now is pointing right at the value um, 10. And above that is the value 40 on the stack. So we pushed it on, essentially, these two statements pushed onto the stack negative 4, uh, sorry, uh, pushed onto the stack 40 and then 10. And then we're going to call call e. And so the call instruction has, basically does two things at once. It takes the value of the next, so it uh, pushes whatever the next instruction that's going to be executed, it pushes that address onto the stack. So that's where it stores the next instruction pointer. And then it jumps to call E and starts executing a call E. So at this point, the stack is going to be the return value, uh, the return instruction address that we want to return to, this next code here, and 10 and 40. So then I'll ask again, why did we subtract 18 in the hex here? Uh, what did we say it was, 24? 24? So the address of the next instruction, we didn't actually do. It's done by the call function. But in essence, the compiler was smart in this case and said, OK, I know I need four bytes for an A. And I know the first thing I'm going to do is call a function. And that function has two ints. So I know 16 bytes there. And I guess it gave itself another four, which I'm not 100. Or did it give itself more than that? Another four? Yeah, another four. I don't exactly know why. but. Um, the return, uh, the one. Don't know. I'll have to look into exactly why it's doing that. Um, but the point is, it kind of optimized this and said, OK, I'm going to allocate this. And then I know the current stack pointer is where essentially what I'm going to pass to call E. And I'm going to move, put 40 and 10 on the stack there as parameters. So basically, instead of. They could have just subtracted enough space for A at first. And then each of these could have been pushed 28 onto the stack, which would have moved the stack. And this could have been pushed 10 onto the stack, which would have moved the stack. And then we could have called call E. But it decided to kind of do this all at once. Uh, maybe it's faster somehow. Yeah. So plus 
plus, remember, so plus goes up into good area. Yeah, because high at top, low at bottom, so plus goes up into good area. Subtracting goes into negative area, but we subtract from EBP, the base pointer, because we know it's already in a good area. All right, and then we have um, what we're going to do afterwards, right? So we're going to move, so what's in EAX after this call instruction? What was it? Yeah. The value of A? Almost. Not quite yet. What's, it's the return of call E. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, but this instruction is taking the return of call E, which is in AEX, and moving it into EBP minus 4, which we haven't seen yet, but what do we think EBP minus 4 is? A. A. It's got to be A, right? Uh, then it's going to move EBP minus 4 into EAX. So why is it doing this? What was that? Yeah, the return of main, right? So main has to put whatever it's going to return in EAX for whoever called it. Then it calls the leave function. So the leave function is also kind of confusing. It does two things at once. It sets the stack pointer to the base pointer and then pops the base pops what's currently on the stack into the base pointer. Uh, so up here we had push EBP, right? So that saved EBP onto the stack. And then here we moved the stack, the stack pointer to the base pointer. And this basically does the reverse. We'll, we'll see exactly how it works, but uh, that's what it does for now. And then return is we're going to return to whoever called us. So which lines of these code actually belong to main that was code that we basically, that we wrote? Did we write this? No. Did we write this? No. Did we write this? No. Did we write these? No. Well, yeah, we called and we, we tried to call a function and we put 10 and 40 on there, right? So we basically wrote these. Uh, what about these ones? More or less, yeah, returning on there. We didn't really write this. Um, so this is what's known as a function prolog. So these Three bytes, uh, these three instructions in particular should be in almost every function that is a C declaration calling convention, right? Because this is the callee's responsibility is to save EVP, create the new base pointer, and allocate space for local variables. So this is the prologue, and what would this one probably be called? The what? Yes, the epilogue, perfect. So yeah, the function epilogue is the end part of a function that's always in every function that that cleans up and gets it ready for the function that calls it. Okay, so then the uh, callee, uh, we'll go over this briefly because we'll come back to this on Monday. So it's gonna first push EBP, right? Because it's what it has to do. It's going to uh, set the new base pointer. Uh, it's going to move one of its parameters, so now EBP plus C into EAX. It's going to move EBP plus 8 into EDX. It's going to add EDX plus EAX, put it in EAX, add 1 to EAX, and then it's going to pop EDX off and return. Uh, so this too has a prologue and epilogue. But very quickly, why doesn't Kali's prologue have subtraction of the stack pointer? Yeah? You already did your stack. We already did it in the main, but that's mains. Each frame is unique to each invocation of each function. No, they're completely separate, yeah. Yeah, there's no local variables, right? So we don't have any local variables here in call E. All we have are our parameters. So I don't need to change the stack pointer to make space for my local variables. So cool. All right, we'll stop here and we'll pick.